isn't this awesome? A coral keratometer. The height of fashion. Maybe in the 60s. Now, not so much. So today I want to talk to you briefly about uh, Dr. Robert Morrison. Uh, this is all covered in his book. I'll put the reference down below. It's out of print, but you can get it on uh, Amazon.com used. Fascinating read. I'm not going to show any of the pictures because they're all copyrighted, but uh, it's fascinating. Uh, very moving story. Very fascinating. Um, early on, he decided he wanted to be in healthcare. He served in World War II in the Army, which qualified him for the uh, GI Bill, but for only four years. So he did some research and he found that optometry was a four-year degree. So I'm proud to say he went to my school, Pennsylvania Qual College of Optometry, and uh, under the GI Bill. And then he really applied himself. He learned everything he could. He attended seminars. He did reading on his own. He talked to people. Established himself as a, as a, with a reputation in contact lenses and optometry. Had his own practice, very successful. Um, then he even became involved in the development of the soft contact lens. He actually talked to Wichterle in Czechoslovakia and ultimately became one of the co-patent holders of the soft contact lens, which was, needless to say, quite lucrative. Um, out of the blue, he gets contacted by the King of Belgium, who was dissatisfied with the acuity that he uh, had with his contacts, which were fit by experts in I think five different countries. Um, so Dr. Morrison traveled to uh, Belgium and found that uh, the king had a diopter in, in one eye and uh, one and a half in the other eye of astigmatism. So he got him some torque, got the king some torque lenses. King was thrilled. The king uh, apparently talked to some of his other uh, royal friends and uh, the queen of the Netherlands, Queen Juliana, contacts uh, Dr. Morrison and she had a, a different problem, more serious. She, she had a, a daughter with a very serious eye problem. And so Dr. Morrison uh, took a look and was, came up with the novel idea of fitting the princess with contact lenses, which had been done before. However, what he did differently was he painted an iris on this contact, which created a small pupil, resulting in a pinhole effect which ultimately gave the princess much better vision so that she was able to read music and play and do all kinds of things. The queen, needless to say, was thrilled. So the queen gave one of her old Rolls Royces to uh, Dr. Morrison, vintage Rolls Royce black with um, fender mounts for flags. And he used to uh, park it outside PCO when he'd, when he'd come and lecture, which is pretty impressive. Dr. Morrison came to PCO and guest lectured. I think it was about 1982. And I remember several other things he said. He said um, he, always, he read a study that uh, people most trusted a, pers a man wearing a white shirt. So in his honor, I've got my white shirt on and a conservative tie. Um, he also said he always got a manicure. He didn't want to point to a near point card and uh, have to worry about his fingernails or whatnot, which is kind of interesting. But the most important thing he told us, and I think this is fascinating, he said, you know, if you are invited bowling and you've never bowled before in your life, and so you go, if you have a really good night and uh, throw a few strikes and whatnot, the next time your friends invite you bowling, you're probably going to say yes. But if you go with your friends and you have a bad night and you throw gutter balls all night, the next time they ask you, you're not going to want to go. So he turned that argument around and said, if there's some aspect of optometry that you're not good at, work on it now to get better because if you're, if you're not good at it, you're just not going to enjoy it. I think that's really good advice. And he was telling us this in school when we still had time to speak with our professors, ask questions, learn from them. After all, we're paying them for, uh, to teach us optometry. Um, what, what are the other takeaways from this guy? I think the big ones are uh, obviously what he just said. Learn all you can about your profession. 
Um, this guy certainly had a passion for eye care, a great passion for eye care, and it, it carried him a long way. Um, he was very professional. Um, he had great integrity for the profession of optometry. And another thing I think to learn is uh, you got to think big. You got to think really big. And he certainly looked for opportunities, and when he found opportunities, he took advantage of them. He became the optometrist to royalty and movie stars and professionals by being a nice guy. Um, there's no substitute for that. You've, you've got to be nice to your patients. I've, I've always tried to do that. Uh, I, I mainly practice in a military setting. It's sort of like an HMO. We have a captive clientele, but I, I never, uh, I always tried to treat my patients with great respect. Even the airmen basics, when they were coming through basic training, I, uh, a lot of the technicians kind of abused the poor uh, trainees, and I was very polite with them, very kind with them. And the last thing I want them to be is stressed out. When I'm trying to find their prescription, if I stress them out, they're going to accommodate. I'm not going to get the right prescription. It's just going to create a mess. So I always spoke to them very kindly. One time I'll never forget, I had a girl, and she, this was their second day of training at Lackland, and she said to me, you're the first person who's spoken to us nicely since we got here, which I thought was kind of an interesting comment, kind of a nice, uh, nice thing to say. Um, in the movie, uh, the Grand, Grand Budapest. Um, I like that line where he says, uh, "Rudeness on the on the part of the customer is sometimes an expression of fear. Fear that they're not going to get what they want." And that's very interesting. When I used to do um, Goldman tonometry on young people, sometimes you know how they blink on you. You know, you can't get a reading. And I used to get very, very frustrated and kind of mad at the patient. And then, you know, I realized it's just a reflex. There's nothing they can do about that. So you just have to work through it and, uh, and uh, go slow, take it easy. <laughs> uh, another time I was running behind and I had an older gentleman who was uh, being a little bit of a jerk. You know, he's complaining that, uh, that I was getting to him late. And uh, there's a natural tendency to want to try to escalate situations like that and get short with the patient. But I resisted that, did the eye exam. When the patient saw that I was spending time with him, I wasn't going to like rush through his eye exam or anything. Uh, he kind of settled down and uh, come to find out that his son, had, his grandson was in a high school football game the night before and he, uh, he was knocked unconscious and he was in a coma. So I think that kind of uh, fits with what uh, Mr. Mustafa was saying on the Grand Budapest. Sometimes uh, people have a reason for why they're short with you, and often it pays to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm always amazed in the military when uh, you know we have a, a captive audience, basically a captive uh, clientele. I was always amazed when patients would tell me in the military they would say you're much nicer than my last optometrist. And I would ask them, well, you know, who was your last optometrist? Was it, was it on base here or was it civilian? And frequently they would tell me that they had been to a civilian optometrist, which strikes me as totally bizarre because if you want to build your practice, if you want your patients to come back, you've really got to be nice to your patients. And uh, I would ask the patient, I'd say, well, what, what exactly did they say to you? And, and they would, frequently they would, they would say things like, well, I had a hard time deciding which choice lens was better, and uh, the optometrist became very short with me. And uh, that just boggles my mind, because uh, you've got to have patience with your, <laughs> you've got to be patient with your patients, let's face it. Um, you've got to be personable. I know a guy up in Rhode Island, um, one thing he does is um, with his female patients, he frequently tells them, he says, oh, I like what you've done with your hair. <laughs> and he admits, he says, I can't remember what their hair was like last time, but women change their hair a lot. 
and uh, you know, if their hair looks good, I'm going to mention it to them. And, and he said, it's amazing how many of them really appreciate that. It's a little bit of manipulation. I wouldn't compliment their hair if they're having a bad hair day because that's going to be obvious. Um, but that's kind of an interesting thing. One thing, I'm going to mention this. I'm hesitant to mention this in the spirit of Dr. Morrison because he was always very kind, always stressed the positive. But when I bring him up, when I mention him to people quite often, um, there are people that are detractors out there. And I got to tell you, I think, I think I know what it is. I think it's a case of uh, cognitive dissonance. Um, you'll speak to successful people. And uh, when I bring up Morrison, um, I'm not even going to tell you what they say, but uh, I think what it is is, uh, you know, they don't have a Rolls Royce. They, uh, they weren't the uh, optometrist to royalty. And uh, the way they justify that in their mind is uh, to have some disparaging comments about a guy. But uh, there's, no argu there's just no argument that uh, this was a very exceptional individual. Great man. He achieved a lot. Another thing that we can learn from him is uh, the willingness to go the extra mile. And, um, you know, I think another thing is it might not be as hard to go the extra mile as you think. I mean, a lot of us tend to self-limit. I'm, I'm probably guilty of that myself. But uh, I think he, he's a good example. He's uh, inspirational in that we should learn all we can about optometry be the best optometrist we can, take the best care of our patients possible. Um, I think this guy did it right. So um, anyway, hope this helps. Read the book or maybe do some uh, online research about Dr. Robert Morrison, Sir Dr. Morrison. And uh, hey, we're all optometrists. We're all in this together. Let's help each other out. Talk to you next time. As an aside, I have to say this, I went to the University of Maryland for my undergrad and uh, another famous person went there, uh, Jim Henson. And interesting, uh, speaking of Earl's Royces, uh, you may know Jim Henson uh, was uh, famous for his puppet work. And uh, he went to the University of Maryland, it took him six years. He was under the six year plan and it wasn't because he was not bright. He was actually working on the forerunner to the Muppets, which was called Sam and His Friends. Um, so six years he graduated. In six years he graduated from uh, University of Maryland. And on the day of graduation, he bought himself a Rolls Royce to drive to graduation. And <laughs> so <laughs> there's two uh, two of my uh, former alumni that uh, drove uh, Rolls Royces. It's kind of a, kind of an amusing story. <laughs> And I remember in an interview one time they asked him about that, and, and he said, well, it, it wasn't that expensive. I bought it used. <laughs>